So welcome everyone uh, to the second day of uh, this uh, Human Cell Plus Symposium in Middle East. Uh, after very um, nice uh, talks and discussions uh, on the first day, we hope we will have even a more exciting uh, session this uh, to, for today. Um, yeah, I am chairing the first session and uh, uh, sometimes with the help of Yusuf. So Yusuf, should we start uh, the, uh, the keynote uh, directly or is there any announcements? Uh, no announcement, just uh, reiterating our welcome to all the uh, attendees. Uh, as you said, we have an exciting set of talks today. We have a keynote and uh, three sessions that we're going to cover in the next few hours. So welcome, everyone. Okay, great. So our keynote speaker is uh, Muhammad Odin. He's an uh, associate professor of human genetics in uh, Bin Rashid Un uh, University in Dubai. So we heard uh, a little of uh, his uh, lab work uh, yesterday and uh, today looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I would like to thank um, HCA, yeah. um, HCA for organizing this symposium and I also like to thank the organizing committee, uh, Yusuf, Christine and everyone who uh, did so much hard work to pull this off. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the genomic origin and cell type specific regulation in neurodevelopmental disorders. So it's a big topic um, because neurodevelopmental disorder itself is a, a huge uh, area of research. It, it actually an umbrella term for many, many disorders. So most of my slides will be summary slides from different studies. Um, but this is just because we have uh, not much time uh, to go to the depth, but I'll try to uh, summarize uh, well enough to uh, that you'll have some message from the studies. So neurodevelopmental disorder, if you look at it, we can categorize into two different um, ways. One is functional and another classification can be those diseases that we see functional and structural deficits. So at the functional level, we see deficits at the synapses and at the structural uh, level, we see some morphological uh, differences in the brain. Uh, for example, micro or macrocephaly have a different, uh, you know, gray matter mass in, in the brain. Focal cortical dysplasia have dysplastic tissue, whereas uh, functional side of the spectrum of the disease, autism spectrum disorders only have mostly have uh, functional deficits at the level of synapses or molecular dysfunctions. Um, some epilepsy doesn't have dysplastic tissue, rather it originates from some cells uh, that are firing differentially so is intellectual disability, obsessive compulsive disorders. So throughout my uh, talk, I'll have um, studies you know, uh, explaining either autism, uh, epilepsy, or broader neurodevelopmental disorders. So if you look at the twin studies of autism, epilepsy, or intellectual disability, these diseases are mostly genetic, and it encompasses a whole host of variants from karyotype to copy number variation to single base pair substitutions. And the recent test uh, whole genome sequencing can be applied to capture all of these variants and can be identified the mutated or the causal variants. The interesting thing about in neurodevelopmental disorders, unlike other common complex diseases, you can sequence these patients and identify the causal variants that are diagnosable. That so molecular diagnostics can be provided from the whole genome sequencing data. So we want to you know integrate so we uh, genetics the knowledge of genetics with single cell transcriptome because we've been doing genetics for a long time you now single cell emerges for the last decade or so and we want to know what are the benefits so we think if we can merge these two it will you know enrich the field especially the disease outcome and we see single cell as a technology that we'll be using to implement precision medicine. So it will be able to identify the tissue of origin, cell type underlying the etiology of traits and diseases, especially for NDDs, 
marker gene mutation tolerance and disease, mutation and transcript specific effect in cell type, which is uh, maybe something new we can, uh, I'll touch base on this in one of our studies, and cell type transcription regulation and splice set mutations. Splice set mutation is a big uh, set of mutation in, in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. And how do we do, uh, you know, the in, end goal, how do we achieve the end goal, cell type specific drug design, which is uh, kind of like a, um, you know, end result for us. So I'll start with um, some genetic studies and how we couple single cell into it. So one of the case study I want to show you is a, a six-year-old kid who had uh, infected by early onset epilepsy. So he was going through a huge onset of uh, seizure, a multiple seizure a day. He used to wear a helmet in, the, in, in his head, because otherwise it, it becomes uh, dangerous for him. Um, so the surgeon at Sickest Hospital in Toronto uh, went in and identified um, putting a green in the brain, um, identified the origin of the tissue where the you know the misfiring of the um, neurons giving this seizure effect, and they kind of resected that part of the brain tissue. So we looked at the brain tissue and identified a five KB heterozygous deletion in STXBP1 gene. So STXBP1 gene is a bona fide gene in terms of genetics. We knew uh, it has been reported many times for kids with um, epilepsy and seizure. Uh, so, but we don't don't know much about the cell type, where it's expressed and what, what it does. So we looked at the tissue itself. We saw that there's a clump of cell that, you know, uh, not uh, spread out well evenly. You see this uh, cells that are, that where the neurons been stained and they are, distributed evenly, but to these blue uh, marked cells that are the uh, nuclei that you can see a lot of cells never migrated, they are clumped together. And this is the origin of the flare signal for the seizure. So we looked at the, you know, um, at that time, back in 2017, the paper published in 2018, but when we looked at the single cell at that time, I, I had no uh, there was no HCA, but there was a paper from Stephen Quake's lab. He uh, published 40, 466 brain cells. And we identified uh, from that data that this gene is predominantly expressed in neurons. And fast forward, uh, the HCA atlas, uh, this is a data that I just uh, put up uh, yesterday uh, for, from 3.2 million brain cells. You can see um, the intensity of the expression on the bar uh, shows uh, still the same results. It's highly expressed in different subtypes of neurons, but not much so in the other uh, glial or uh, other non-neuronal cell types. So this is very interesting, uh, you know, the, the information because we know that STXVP is a neurotransmitter and it makes sense to only or selectively expressed in neurons, but if you want to look at cellular heterogeneity in autism, autism is very diverse disease. Uh, it's a host, collection of rare, uh, many rare uh, condition within the spectrum. And this is some of the genes, uh, 100 genes been mapped into this uh, ideogram where it shows the genes that are uh, impacted uh, and validated to have causal mutation for autism. To know um, what type of cell type that it converges for autism is a is a big kind of answer to us, but also it kind of shows how heterogeneous it is in terms of phenotypes and genotype. So what we have done, um, since those 100 genes are not uh, the only genes that are mutated, we looked at big, big studies and we collected uh, roughly around 1,000 de novo loss of function mutations from 26 autism cohorts. And these data coming from 40,000 cases for uh, either whole exome or whole, whole genome were sequenced. 852 genes being impacted by this loss of function mutation uh, in autism. And our study is to find the cell types uh, that, that are you know, re regulated by these genes. That, that was the initial study because we didn't have autism brain tissue, which is impossible to get. Um, 
so what we did, we looked at Allen brain span data uh, and we used anterior cingulate cortex, primary visual cortex and middle temporal gyrus. These are different uh, cortical region of the brain. And we looked at the cell type. We, we kind of did our own PCA clustering at that time. And we identified the cell types and uh, looked at different um, glial, non-neuronal non and neuronal cell types. So, so this is just the initial analysis of the known genes that known to be you know mutated in autism. SCN two a widely mutated in autism case. So so is CAG eight, and you can see uh, SCN two a is uh, highly expressed uh, for almost all the subtype of neurons, but not these three or uh, four uh, cell types that are non neuronal cell types. Whereas CHD is also ubiquitously expressed, doesn't lead to any particular cell type. Um, but when we combined all the 800 genes, what we identified is that the you know uh, odds ratio to have uh, to implicate uh, the having those genes differentially regulated as marker genes. Um, these are the cell types that uh, popped up uh, mostly for autism. So uh, you can see there are different ne neuronal and non-neuronal cell types, but one cell type that was surprising to us uh, that shows in all three different cortical plates, the, these are uh, astrocytes, uh, their marker genes are being mutated in different autism uh, patients. So that, that's uh, the circle red. And we looked at what kind of genes uh, is there and is the regulation only, some of the genes only regulated in astrocytes, not in neurons. So this is the two examples I'm showing you, CANC1 and Planck's B1 mutations are shown in the exons and the red ones are the loss of function mutations that have been identified in autism cases. And you can see the CANC1 gene actually selectively uh, expressed in uh, different non-neuronal cells, um, and it is highly expressed in astrocytes compared to other non-neuronal. So is Planck's B. We looked at um, the human, um, you know, the atlases, and also the mouse brain. And interestingly, what we have found that the mouse uh, brain shows also the selective expression of the ast uh, astrocytes. So this regulation of this gene is conserved through different mammals. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, primate data uh, at that time, but uh, I'm sure it will be conserved among, among primates too. So this kind of shows a different subset of autism. Um, but when you look at the convergence of these genes, and you find that, um, all these genes implicates um, these three major, among other, the three ma major pathways. So the pathway for neurotransmitter um, kind of exchange between pre and postsynaptic uh, regulation been impacted by these genes, chromatin remodeling pathways, and also ne neuro neural projection pathways where the neurons comes from subventricular zone and place it into different cortical plates that also get, get, gets impacted by this gene. So there is no single convergence for autism. Unfortunately, we don't see any um, single cell type. The interesting discovery for, is that the non-neuronal cell type has been implicated now. So after a paper came out, there are a few other paper also showed exercise being one of the major cell types that's been disruptively uh, regulated um, in autism brain. So now well, I want to move into um, more a bit more clinical um, uh, paradigm. So we do clinical, you know, the, the clinical diagnosis, molecular diagnosis, doing genome-wide sequencing or genome-wide microarray. What we find is a lot of variants remain uncharacterized. A lot of mutation remain uncharacterized. So how can we leverage single cell um, transcriptome data to characterize those mutation and make discovery for the you know for causation or find causation for neuro neurodevelopmental disorders so this is a gene called neurobin uh, the gene symbol known as ppt pp uh, sorry pp1r9a and this gene being implicated in neurodevelopmental disorders 
And the, you can see the SNBs, the single nucleotide variants impacting different protein domains, also the disordered domains of the protein. Uh, but the functional consequences of this mutation remain uncertain, do not lead to, um, you know, the classification are very uh, uncertain for clinical consequences. So structural variation, you can see the red bars, the impact, uh, all of these have been found uh, in different neurodevelopmental disorder patients impacting uh, PVP1 or 9A gene. Some of these deletions are found to be de novo. We tested that uh, they don't, uh, they are not in the parents' DNA. So it kind of shows a strong association, but not necessarily causation because PPP1 or 9A gene or neurobin itself is not um, been in a model to show the, any behavioral or pathogenic uh, causation for neurodevelopmental disorders. So to do that exactly, to identify the uh, you know, functional or physiological characteristics of neurobin uh, and relate to the phenotype, we did CRISPR. So we introduced mutation and exon 2. That's one base pair insertion that truncates the protein. So the wild type protein you can see have many different um, uh, domain. When we in, in, introduce this one base pair insertion, it kind of uh, introduced a, a stop codon uh, very early. And the mutated protein looks very small that has the acting binding domain and lose most of it. So this has been identified in the Western blot experiment as well. So we want to characterize this mutated um, kind of uh, protein, what it does and having a mutation, truncated mutation, which is also what we see in patients because this is a heterozygous mutation we induced through CRISPR. Does it have a phenotype, a molecular phenotype? to make that causation. And that will eventually help those mutation uh, to characterize from maybe uncertain to pathogenic may lead to more diagnosis for those patients. So to do that, of course, we don't have access to the brain uh, cells of the patient. So what we did, we uh, used human induced pluripotent stem cell and we induced uh, the ectoderminal, uh, you know, ectoderminal pathway and that led to the neural progenitor cells, and we differentiated the NPCs into neurons uh, using the E8 media. So in in, a, in this figure, you can show uh, you can see the you know contrast between the NPCs on top and the neurons on the bottom that has um, uh, the visible neurite, and also neon markers are visibly kind of uh, expressed uh, in neurons, not in NPCs. So, so is MAP2. And uh, those are NPCs marker that are also been found to be expressed in NP NPCs, not in neurons. So then what we did, we have uh, taken that you know mutated line and the wild type um, and did electrophysiology and morphological analysis. So in, during our electrophysiology, we recorded the firing of the action potential from wild type and neurons that are mutated. And we identified that with time, the length of the, uh, or the voltage of the signal is much reduced in uh, why, you know, heterozygous mutated uh, neuron cell cells uh, or neurons compared to the wild type neurons. It's been validated multiple times, uh, not just in one recording. And we also did some morphological analysis that shows the neurons um, that we mutated have a bit of an overgrowth of the neurites, and it has more attention points compared to the wild type. Um, so next, what we did, we took the wild type uh, and the neurobin heterozygous mutate, mutate lines, and we did long read uh, sequencing uh, using single cell kit. And the isoform um, gave us a kind of like a very interesting data, but we also did the gene-based uh, uh, clustering. So we are going to show you now from our experiment, uh, gene-based and transcript-based uh, analysis. So this is the gene-based clustering that we have done, where uh, the NPCs, the neural progenitor 
uh, cells, be, uh, we have uh, kind of merged the mutated and the control data together. And you can see the ratio of the mutation, uh, mutated cells and the control cells are equal, the red and the green bars for NPCs. When we differentiated the neurons, uh, uh, two neurons, and we uh, found out the clusters. So these are actually our protocol, or most of the pro protocol that a neuro, new, neuron generation protocol produces matching neurons uh, in different that are uh, present in different cortical plates, and some uh, you know an NPCs might also be there. Uh, so we, what we saw that the neurons that we have differentiated in mutant and in wild type uh, have a different ratio of cells. So if you see, for example, LAMP5 uh, kind of um, inhibitory cells that are not present much in uh, in a wild type, but if you see the other higher level cortical regions, for for example, L5 or L6 excitatory neurons, that also prominent in the mutant line, not much into the um, wild type, which is kind of like the opposite we see in uh, lower cortical plates, um, L2 or L3 uh, neurons. We see a huge um, you know uh, number of neurons in wild type that we, we lost in the, into the mutant lines. So it shows a total disruption or imbalance in cortical layer neurons. That kind of shows the why we see that uh, neuroid outgrowth and synaptic uh, kind of uh, signaling uh, that is d different from the wild type. And then what we, that was the gene-based clustering. So we moved on to do transcript-based clustering. So transcript-based clustering is interesting because it has the dependencies, but again, you can also, between the, between the transcript, but regulatory dependencies, but you can still uh, make cluster, thinking of each transcript have its own regulatory path. And the way we did it uh, is to combining um, the NPCs and the neurons of the wild type uh, separately and mutant uh, NPC and neurons separately to find out the trajectories, how this uh, tra you know, tra tra transcript been regulated throughout the different clusters. And the, the start point is always the NPCs because that's where we started. And our you know, uh, pseudo time um, path shows that from NPCs, Again, it goes uh, along with the gene-based analysis. The you know uh, differentiation actually progresses from NPCs to a higher cortical layer neurons, then moved into lower cortical layer neurons. So these are lower cortical neurons. Uh, this is L2. These are L4 that been you know um, differentiated first, then uh, the lower cortical neurons in mutant line. We don't see that in uh, wild type uh, cells or neurons. So this kind of di differential progression um, of uh, neurobin mutated gene um, gives us an idea that it will have a very different organization of neurons in different cortical plates than the co control um, individuals. So we looked at where, how neurobin transcript are expressed between uh, wild type and mutant. To our surprise, we only see one transcript being expressed in the wild type um, and this kind of uh, expressed in, in some of these, uh, you know, uh, high cortical plate, not much in low cortical plate, you know, wild type uh, neurons uh, from NPCs. Whereas uh, mutant have four different transcripts that has been activated. So these four transcripts, uh, we don't know uh, exactly what they do, but it seems like they also have some selective bias where they're expressed. For example, th th this cluster doesn't have this particular um, transcript express at all. So they are uh, being selectively expressed in different cell types. And this uh, phenomena actually not be, we, we were not aware of this type of transcript uh, that can be, you know, cell type specific, that can adopt cell type specific regulation um, because of the mutation without doing the long read uh, sequencing. So long read, we're able to bring uh, this level of depth into the analysis. And we did the pathway of the dysregulated gene and 
One thing uh, strongly came out after a multiple correction test is the pathway for nervous system development. So how the uh, you know uh, neurogenesis happens that gets dysregulated by these genes uh, for the neurobin mutated cell, line, cell lines. Um, so now that we have the idea of transcript, what's been expressed, what's uh, and which transcript is being expressed in imitation line uh, than, than the wild type. So we want to design uh, the proof of concept uh, and anti antisense oligonucleotide to degrade the targeted mRNA. mRNA. So what happens is uh, if you have an mRNA uh, of interest, you design antisense that have the lock-in nucleotide uh, that are spanned on two sides and in the middle, you have the target DNA. So it will find that particular, they also, also will find that particular mRNA and will lock in. And that will, that lock in or double, du, double strand helix will be uh, invalid to the cell and RNAH will be, re, will be called to degrade the mRNA. So that's how the translation gets stopped. So we did our analysis uh, to identify or design the ASO. So uh, my postdoctoral fellow, uh, Zehra, actually, she did the, uh, all the work. Um, the ASO being uh, targeted to the mutation transcript, this part of that um, sequence is present in all four transcripts that we have seen. And this is a control that's not been injected with ASO. This is a ASO injected uh, control, uh, wild type. And this is a mutation uh, line with uh, without ASO injected. And this is uh, different levels of uh, uh, ASO that we have injected and identify that there are certain design of the ASO can knock down um, half of the transcript. And you will assume it should lock, uh, knock down half because it is a heterozygous mutation. So this ASO is targeting the mutated transcript within, within the mutated lines and it shows uh, half of exactly almost 50 percent uh, knockouts of the gene. Mohamed, you have uh, about two minutes. Okay, so uh, I, I want to spend these two minutes just to describe a small project that we are doing. Uh, it relates to technology development. So if you look at nature and the clusters that we see, uh, these are multidimensional. The clusters also happens for some reason there is an objective behind it. But the way we do clustering um, in, 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 or for single cell doesn't have, it's, it's not multidimensional, you apply PCA, so it removes the dimensionality from it. And there is no objective. You see the variance, the cluster happens because they are close together in terms of their variance, but we do not interpret the variance. We impose our objectives on those and then find out the, or discover some relation. So a cell can go, th go through many different uh, trajectories, it has it is multidimensional, it has velocity, it has spatial location, it goes through splicing, all 20,000 plus genes have different regulation, it has a time, it has a cell cycle, so all of these get reduced down to a two-dimensional two array. And this is what we want to develop, we want to develop a high-dimensional clustering, keeping all of these variances, not reducing through PCA. So we have developed an unsupervised genetic algorithm. It's a niche branch of artificial intelligence. Um, just uh, to be respectful of the time, uh, we did clustering using Surat and our uh, new AI, and we identified that we I do identify more cell types uh, and clusters, but we also detect the cell types that have been detected by Surat. So this is a comparison of some uh, blood cells that have the Monocytes, um, you know, uh, they, they have detected two different monocytes. We, de we do detect three different. Uh, same with the CD4 types. So they, there are three different CD4 types in Syria. We, we do have five. So, the, it, but it keeps intact the interpretability of the cluster. And this is ongoing research uh, because we want to do cluster with objective. We want to interpret, we want to interpret the data based on the uh, objective of the single cell. So this is where I stop. And I want to thank some of my colleagues uh, here at the Center for Applied and Transnational Genomics uh, at MBRU in Dubai Health. And thank you so much. I would love to take some questions.
Thank you. So, yeah, uh, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A. Maybe I can start with uh, one question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, so very interesting results about um, how reproducible is that like um, mutant to wild type ratios in different oh. clusters? Right? Because it says through differentiation, proliferation, I mean, many there are many stochastic... Uh, that, that's uh, that's a very good question. Um, for example, this is kind of uh, ideal scenario where we want to see the equal number uh, NPCs maybe because uh, we, you know, same type of regulation going on. Uh, but we saw the differences in neurons and you're right, there's so many stochastic variation that can happen. That is why we are trying to, this research is not done yet we're trying to reproduce this into the transcript level information do we see that level of uh, differences uh, between the mutant and the wild type uh, uh, regulation in different cell types yeah Th that that's what we're doing uh, right now yeah thank you okay i yeah there is a question from yourself please yes, Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. This is really a nice overview ending with an exciting new method for uh, clustering. Uh, question is about neurobin specifically. And if uh, if there is a, uh, any data or like a mouse knockout for this gene, uh, just any phenotypes they display, I don't know if they exist or not. And also the developmental uh, expression patterns for this gene. Because, you know, there is the whole argument of the prenatal origin, yeah. plus the contribution of uh, all the other cell type that you mentioned, if you can just give us an overview of that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so so uh, I think we, we haven't seen a single uh, paper that model uh, the mutation for Nirobin. There is no animal model yet. So that uh, th that's why I think we... we uh, we took it in, in, as a project because not much known. Um, so we, ha you're right. If there's an animal model, it will have uh, it, it give us that other side to it, the behavioral side, because of the mutation. What happens to uh, the behavior? So that we don't have. And for uh, neurobin uh, de developmental trajectory, unfortunately, there's not much um, there to look into. Uh, uh, in the developmental trajectory because to produce uh, say uh, prenatal neuron is extremely hard there is no viable protocol so it's all mature neurons all the time so we are kind of stuck in that uh, area but i totally get your point because this uh, genetic disease they they born with this mutation actually and the, the brain development actually happens mostly in in a prenatal stage uh, then postnatal. So that's kind of important time period for us to look into. But unfortunately, we don't have much data, especially uh, we don't have neurobin mutated uh, prenatal data. That's, we don't know how to produce that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mohammed. Let's uh, move on to our next speaker, who is um, Shahar Alon. He's running um, a spatial genomics lab at the Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv. So, do we have Shahar here? Yes, yeah, something is happening. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, yeah, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, so can I just start? We still don't see your slides. Yeah. How about now? Can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, so thank you for this uh, opportunity in this uh, very unique symposium. Um, 
So, uh, as you know, my name is Shachar, and I'm from the Faculty of Engineering at uh, Barlan University in Israel. And I want to talk about the uh, nanoscale in situ sequencing of tissues. Um, so, so basically, this relates to a new uh, emerging field, the field of uh, spatially resolved transcriptomics, which is a family of technologies that uh, are making uh, a, a huge difference in genomics, actually turning over genomics as we know it, because for the first time it's allow us to uh, um, map the locations of genes um, inside tissues. Basically this family of technologies, spatially resolved uh, transcriptomics, um, bridge the gap that you see in this, this slide the gap between um, imaging and genomics. With, uh, with, with imaging, so say with uh, um, light microscopy, you can have a very good resolution. You can see the morphology uh, of a tissue. You can see a location of say one gene, but you are very limited by the number of genes that you can study. Or, in, in, in more general terms, but the number of molecules that you can study. This is basically the limitation is the number of different colors that you can separate with your eyes. On the other hand, with genomics, uh, for example, RNA sequencing or in situ or, or single cell, uh, um, or with single cell sequencing, you can basically see all the genes. You can quantify um, all the genes, all the genome, but you have no information about location in space. And so the new technologies, the, the new technologies of uh, spatial result transcriptomics is bridging this gap. And you can see here several examples of technologies that emerged over the last few years. And, and for the first time, this allows us to both quantify many genes and with, uh, with some information about the location in space. However, with current state-of-the-art technologies, there is a trade-off that needs to be done. You can either have high spatial resolution, meaning the ability to see single individual cells in the tissue, but then you have limited molecular resolution, meaning that you can't study many genes. You can only study a handful of genes. On the other hand, you can have very high molecular resolution. You can basically see all the genes, for example, with technologies like SlideSeq, but then you have a very limited spatial resolution. You can't even see individual cells. Um, so we uh, invented this uh, new technology termed expansion sequencing that as you can guess from my introduction can allow both high spatial resolution and high molecular resolution. Um, the, the, the technology is, is built upon the idea that you can physically magnify tissues. You can use a hydrogel, as you can see in this image, um, in this cartoon. You can use a hydrogel that is embedded inside the tissue, and then you physically magnify the tissue. And, and this is based on expansion microscopy, which is a technology recently invented by MIT. So with this, we can amplify individual RNA molecules inside tissues. And what we do next is perform RNA sequencing reaction. Imagine that you take, uh, for example, Illumina kit, and you look inside Illumina kits, and you, you basically have, for the sequencing reaction to work, you have these enzymes, and you have nucleotides that have fluorophores on them. So we basically take this Illumina kits and perform this reaction inside tissues. And, and basically, the, the physical magnification of the tissue that I mentioned before it gives us two things. It gives us the ability to have very good resolution, basically super resolution, because of the physical magnification, because of the fact that molecules are now uh, very far from one another. And second of all, we can perform this in situ sequencing, because the enzymes required for the sequencing reaction um, can now um, have accessibility to the RNA molecules. And this is what you see in this uh, cartoon. We perform the sequencing inside the tissues. So in my lab, we are using this uh, expansion uh, um, sequencing 
technology for uh, in two domains. The first domain is the study of nouns, and the second domain is the study of um, of uh, cancer biology. Specifically, what we mostly care about, as you see in this cartoon, is uh, um, in, in the application of neurons, is the physical connection between the neurons, the, the, the synapse between the neurons, which uh, in the synapse can be nanometer in, in size. And we want to map uh, genes in these regions. And similarly, in the, in the cancer biology uh, applications, we care about the immunological synapse the physical connection between tumor cells and immune cells. So I'll now briefly give you examples of the things that we uh, do in the lab. The first example relates to the distribution of RNA neurons. And uh, as you can see, this image distribution, neurons, uh, studying neurons in the brain is difficult because neurons have many projections. This is uh, uh, one clear thing from this image. They have many projections and they also have you, see, you can see the bulges, the spines in these neurons. The, these are the locations that the actual connection between the neurons is made. And these are very small. Actually, you wouldn't even see them without super resolution. So this, this image is not standard image microscopy. So uh, it, it's not trivial to, to perform uh, in situ sequencing on these uh, examples, but um, using spine microscopy, we will we were able to map the entire hippocampus of the mouse. Um, this is what you see in this image, the entire hippocampus. And I'm going to show you just two zoom-in regions, the, the regions in, in orange, two zoom-in regions that shows the uh, shape of the neurons and the RNA uh, sequencing that we perform on them. So um, you see that we can have uh, morphology good enough to uh, locate dendrites and even axon, axons. So we know which genes are present in, in which uh, compartment of the, of the neuron. And we actually have resolution good enough that we now can see genes for the first time inside spines, inter, inside these small physical connections between neurons. So using this data, we uh, generated these um, models of gene expression in neurons. Uh, so, so this is very initial, but it's still interesting because we, we see these three patterns. In pattern number one, we have expression of genes only in the cell body. In pattern number two, we have expression of genes all over the place, all over the, the, the neuron, including the projection. But genes in, that have pattern number three are very interesting because these genes have expression, high expression in the cell body, but also they have expression which is specific to synapses, to spines, as you can see here. So, so these genes are, are, are very interesting because they might be linked to learning and memory because they are present in the physical connection between the neurons. Now in the lab, we uh, perform similar uh, analysis. Um, second. All right. We perform similar analysis on the whole fly brain. So here I'm showing the whole fly brain. We're going through the Z sections of the fly of the fly brain, and each dot, each colorful dot that you see, is one RNA molecule that we sequence. And you can see that we also have the morphology of this one cell type that we care about in this brain. So we have the morphology, and we even have the projections. So performing these sequencing in the whole fly brain, we can generate. Um, these maps that have, here I'm just showing just one Z plane. Uh, we have these maps that show the location of each gene that we sequence. In this case, we sequence 100 genes, but we can perform um, a very high, we can, we are not limited to the number of genes that we can sequence. We perform sequencing on 100 genes, and then we overlay this information on the morphology of the genes. Oh, sorry, on the morphology of the neurons. So this allows us to ask questions about how neuronal activation, say, in the, in the fly brain, is uh, related to the subcellular localization of the genes in the tissue. So now I want to switch gears and give you some example of the things that we do in cancer biology. So I'm going to start by saying that immunotherapy is a revolution in cancer treatment. I'm sure that most of you know about this. 
Um, basically, immunotherapy means that we use uh, the immune cells of, of our body to attack tumor cells instead of trying to attack the tumor cells themselves directly. So one example of uh, immunotherapy uh, is uh, checkpoint inhibitor drugs that you see in this cartoon. Yeah, if oh. you can uh, like uh, be a bit quicker, maybe in one or two minutes, because we are- Sure, about... sure. Uh, I'm, I'm just about to, to finish. So uh, um, we can, uh, we also know about immunotherapy that it, it's, uh, will not work for most patients. And the question is obviously why? And uh, we think that might be related to how we are, um, how we are um, a, in making a decision about which treatment will get the treatment, about which patients will get the treatment. Basically right now, say for PDL one treatment, we only, we only ask the question if, if the PDL one is expressed in the biopsy, but um, we know that, um, we, we know that in order for immunotherapy to work, we need T cells to be present to attack the tumor cells. So we, we don't really know if they are present. So the next step in treatment will be to look into biopsies and to see uh, if we have immune cells here shown in green and tumor cells in red. Um, but in my lab, we want to take this one step further and zoom in into interacting cells and ask if they zooming into individual cells and ask if they are interacting. And this is what you see in this cartoon. We, are, we have the resolution that allows us to look at individual cells that are in contact and detect genes. As you can see uh, the, the red gene here that are only highly expressed in uh, um, when these cells are in contact. And it turns out that this is indeed the case. If we zoom in uh, into biopsies, these are breast cancer uh, biopsies that we got from patients, we see uh, individual genes that are interacting related, interaction related, for example, this one gene, LAMA1, shown in red, is wholly, only only expressed in subset of T cells when they are in physical contact with tumor cells. So we believe that this can, in, in fact, better, uh, um, uh, maybe can make a better prediction about the success of immunotherapy because we don't, we not only look at if T cells are present next to tumor cells, we also can uh, tell if they are interacting. So with that, I would just I would like to thank you for listening and my lab members and my funding. Thank you. Thanks a lot, very cool technology. So is there any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, please write, type your questions and share if you can take a look if there are questions there because we have to move on now. Thanks a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, we have a question from yourself. So, well, if I might just ask a question, thank you sure, for sure. your talk. So, the the sub uh, localization is very very interesting. We have a colleague here uh, with us at Inouye Abu Dhabi who works on 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 the molecular signatures that actually can explain this. And so she, she looks at the epitranscriptomics where they can explain that some of those genes, their localization actually driven by these epitranscriptomic marks. But this method, in their case, they know what they're looking for, the genes. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, there is a lot of room for discovery uh, as to why the genes are... So how can this single cell data help in that? in like making like at least identification of new unknown genes that could potentially be then followed up either to look at their epitranscriptome or other uh, yeah. I, I completely agree. This is uh, um, one, one direction that we really care about because using this technology, we can actually perform what, what I showed are results for targeted sequencing, meaning that we know in advance which genes we want to target, but the more interesting part is to perform it in an untargeted way. And then we can have, uh, um, we can generate data about new genes, as you say, that are press expressed. So we, we already demonstrated that this can be done. And now we are continuing this line of work to uh, uh, see more genes, new, more new genes and and after that, as you said, the mechanism is a is a, is the next question. What makes these genes expressed in this unique pattern? Thank you.
Okay, great. Thanks, Sharon. So, uh, Shahar, sorry. Uh, and now we have um, Ali Al Faiz. Uh, he's um, the chair of bioinformatics at the King Fahad Hospital. Are you here, Ali? Okay, I we... see his slide. Okay. Ali, I think you might just need to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Great. Now, yes. Yeah. But we don't right. see your video. So if you turn on that as well. Okay. All right. Can you guys see me? Yes. Great. 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 So uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, to everyone, wherever you might be. Uh, thank you for having me in uh, part of this uh, symposium. Uh, today's, uh, I'll talk about the ethical and regulatory consideration in clinical cell, uh, single cell sequencing. What prompted this uh, presentation is that we were currently working on a single cell uh, sequencing project and uh, we were recruiting patients and we had a couple of uh, issues regarding how to explain it and things like that. So uh, in, in terms of data, so I thought this would be a good uh, venue to actually express some of the things that we were uh, faced with uh, during this uh, project. So uh, just uh, a quick uh, look at uh, this presentation uh, where we're going to be defining uh, what is single cell sequencing. I think we can rush through that and the different uses, clinical applications, the ethical considerations of uh, single cell sequencing versus bulk NGS, such as whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. And then uh, the regulatory considerations that we have uh, come across and uh, just a brief overview of our recommendations towards these uh, considerations that we have faced. So uh, I was talking to Christian offline and uh, I showed her this slide and she's like, I think you're one of the few people that actually use this analogy. I'm sure that everyone knows it in terms of uh, single cell sequencing relative to bulk sequencing where we have the smoothie analogy. So uh, the, smoothie, the smoothie is the bulk sequencing where we do whole genome or whole uh, exome or whole RNA sequencing uh, relative to single cell sequencing where we actually isolate each of those cells or fruits in this case, and uh, we sequence them on, uh, on, uh, in isolation. So uh, this is just a brief overview. Now, uh, there are a lot of benefits to uh, single cell sequencing, such as uh, cellular heterogeneity, resolution and precision, rare cell identifications, as my uh, colleagues uh, during this symposium have uh, shown great insight into. Uh, personalized insight in terms of uh, what kind of uh, drugs this kind of person can take and uh, more characterization of the disease that they're uh, afflicted with, and uh, more along the line, uh, the disease progression. Uh, we can see that single cell sequencing have uh, given a lot of insight into what could be done and uh, what are the best approaches, either by characterizing the disease itself or characterizing what can be actually done for the future of this uh, of the patient. Now, uh, in terms of the clinical applications of uh, single cell sequencing, there's the oncological uh, aspect of it, and there's the drug response and monitoring, gene therapy, disease biomarkers, and so on and so forth. As we have seen uh, during this symposium and across different publications that have risen exponentially during the past uh, couple of years, the, the incorporation of single cell sequencing is coming in across the board. And uh, in some instances, the, it's actually being the bulk sequencing is slowly being uh, taken out and the introduction of single cell sequencing is being incorporated. And this is due to a number of factors such as the more data that we have, the more precise the data we have, the more concrete and more foundation we have to go on in terms of uh, what can we do for the patient, what are the best drugs that can be used and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the issue with, uh, with the introduction of single cell sequencing relative to bulk sequencing is that 
there are a number of issues uh, when we're standing from an ethical and a regulatory point of view that we see that the uh, for example, in, uh, in bulk sequencing, there is uh, some acceptance in terms of uh, the definition of it. There is uh, people are slowly getting informed about what is next generation sequencing uh, and uh, so on and so forth. The issue with single cell sequencing is that when you want to actually inform a patient that they're gonna be part of a certain project that involves single cell sequencing, uh, the concept of single cell sequencing remains too hard to explain, especially when we're talking to patients that are not in the science field, patients that are, uh, uh, they have uh, a certain uh, look at it, uh, patients that do not have any kind of uh, idea about what is NGS in the first place. So once we talk about single cell sequencing versus bulk sequencing, one of the main issues that we look at in terms of ethically is that informed consent and the challenges that it presents in uh, these projects. Uh, also, when we talk about the privacy complexity of uh, data uh, for bulk sequencing versus single cell sequencing, uh, there is a number of regulatory bodies that have been work working on uh, next generation sequencing uh, regulation or uh, uh, the ethical standing of uh, data to be shared and versus privacy versus uh, uh, incidental findings and so on and so forth. While with single cell sequencing, I think because of its trajectory and because of its uh, uh, new uh, introduction into the field, there hasn't been time for regulatory agencies to actually uh, go hand in hand with its uh, with its uh, trajectory and uh, try to actually find uh, different venues to actually think of the ethical considerations behind the single cell sequencing and the data that is generated. And lastly, well, we have uh, seen a number of uh, papers that have actually looked at the FAIR guidelines for uh, findable, accessible, interpretable, and researchable uh, guidelines for NGS data. Now, when we look at single cell sequencing, uh, these FAIR guidelines, we believe that uh, should be reviewed and looked at from a single cell sequencing uh, perspective due to the different, ch different uh, data that it presents. And when we talk about different data, what kind of information that is being relayed out there that uh, in terms of anonymization, and uh, anonymity, uh, de-identified information, but at the same time, it needs to be searchable. So all of these uh, needs to be taken into consideration from an ethical uh, perspective. Now, once we look at the uh, regulatory uh, consideration, and uh, I have uh, been a part of a committee here in Saudi Arabia regarding uh, uh, facilitating and uh, managing and governing uh, next generation uh, sequencing data, we see that there is a lot of uh, milestones that have been taken uh, across the board uh, internationally regarding how to actually protect next generation sequencing data. Of course, there is a spectrum of uh, regulatory uh, uh, laws and regulations for different countries, but we see that with uh, single cell sequencing, there is more information, more information that could actually be identified uh, uh, that could lead to the identification of the patient, right? Because we're looking at specific cells, right? And uh, these specific cells provide more information about the inform about the uh, about the patient. So one of the things that we looked at is, how can we actually make it more, uh, we, we wanted to implement the bulk sequencing uh, data protection on single cell sequencing. Unfortunately, we're having some issues with that uh, currently. Uh, and then we have the quality control and uh, uh, quality control complexity uh, versus the bulk sequencing where we already have a quality control and standardization such as from the American College of Medical Genetics, uh, how to do the analysis, 
for whole genome sequencing, how to do the analysis for whole exome sequencing, for RNA sequencing, how to benchmark, how to uh, make sure that the pipeline or analysis used needs to be reproducible, what are the major uh, quality control checks that are uh, put in place to actually make sure that this uh, pipeline is uh, of uh, good QC and a QA. Uh, now, for single cell sequencing, we see that there is a, a myriad of uh, methods that use single cell sequencing. And uh, through that, and we can see that over the past uh, year or so, that a number of different methods have been uh, established where uh, single cell sequencing is a supplement, is a major part of that method that can actually help a lot in uh, diagnosing uh, diseases, help a lot in actually characterizing different tumors, help a lot in actually making drugs more precise for the patients and subtyping uh, the, whether it's neurodegenerative diseases, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and so on. So, with that, we have uh, an issue because every can, lab. Ali, sir, can, can you uh, maybe wrap up in two minutes so that we can also have a. All right. All right. So it's, yeah. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also. Uh, so uh, that's in terms of the quality control uh, complexity. And from a uh, compliance and documentation standpoint for uh, bulk sequencing, as again, we have and already made uh, compliance and documentation from different uh, organizations that have uh, outlined what are the compliance and documentation, such as the CAP in terms of uh, next generation sequencing. But when it comes to uh, single cell sequencing, these organizations are still a step behind where they actually need to incorporate this kind of um, technology into their uh, recommendations or uh, compliance and documentation uh, regulations. So uh, for that, in terms of the ethical uh, uh, recommendations that we have in terms of informed consent, there needs to be a more layman, uh, more layman uh, informed consent for people once they are presented with single cell sequencing and they need to be differentiated from bulk sequencing. Uh, so that the patient can actually understand what they're getting into. And this is one of their rights as uh, as a party to uh, the project. And also if it's going to be used in a clinical diagnosis. Uh, the other thing is that we need to be more in, uh, in light of what kind of information that is going to be stored and what kind of information that is going to be uh used and this this patient needs to know what kind what are the things that uh they need to uh what are what kind of information is going to be uh, re uh retained for them and in terms of the fair uh guidelines for bulk sequencing we can also attribute that uh with single cell sequencing but i think there is going to be some adjustments in terms of anonymization and governance of uh different uh ethical uh, standings regarding the data for single cell sequencing. Uh, for the regulatory aspects of it, data privacy and uh, protection, again, needs to be reviewed and implement a strict access and encry in, uh, encryption due to the more information that identifies the patient or identifies the, pri or the uh, participant in that uh, project. Uh, the quality control complexity of the uh, the quality control of uh, these methods needs to be uh, streamlined and in terms of the clinical regulatory compliance also they need to be updated to make sure that there is enough uh, documentation regarding what kind of methods in terms of single cell sequencing are you being used and is there a streamlined uh, protocol that can be applied across the board in different methods of the single cell sequencing. So uh, this is uh, our recommendations. And uh, I think I did not, I hope I did not go over my time. So uh, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. And I don't still see any questions in the chat. So uh, maybe I can start by asking, so how does, uh, like, of course, like everyone wants more data and it's a challenge everywhere in the field. Like I am working in Germany. I can see that Germany is also struggling with uh, uh, 
having more patients data. So how how is like a very Middle East position? So you are in Saudi Arabia. So do you have some idea? Like um, are we? Yeah. Like so 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 basically, age or more advanced, more behind. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, being advanced or uh, or behind are uh, the uh, the governance of uh, NGS data in general. It's uh, it's slowly coming along across uh, different countries, but it depends on the uh, country's per perspective in terms of what do they want to do? Do they want to keep it private? I know that there, for example, in, uh, in the U.S., they're more lenient in terms of uh, data sharing uh, companies uh, actually uh, having that uh, data. It's, con it's part of their monetization of their uh, business. So uh, with us here in Saudi Arabia, we don't have that in the mindset. We are more of trying to protect the data, making sure that the patient is uh, knows where their data is going how can they get uh, get access to it if they want and if they want if they want to be destroyed they have uh, their husband put some uh, strict uh, regulations in terms of that so um we are we i believe that we have a number of uh issues and challenges to tackle but i think uh we're in the right track thank you yusuf uh also maybe uh very quickly yeah Question. Yes, and just very quickly. Thank you so much, Ali. We we raised a lot of concerns that we all share in the region. I'm just curious about because you you talk specifically about single cells and RNA seq and genome sequencing, but there is also genetic editing, CRISPR, uh, pluripotent stem cells. So is this done all as, as 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 a framework that really will cover all these applications, or are there like specific things about single cell? Yeah. So uh, and uh, we're looking at to. Uh, we're looking for an over or a general overview of in terms of protocol. But during in that protocol, we need to make sure that we subtype it. For example, uh, the introduction of uh, of uh, gene therapy, right? Uh, we know that in terms of gene therapy, there's going to be a lot of data that is being uh, generated. So we'll tackle that on each on its own. So this is our mindset. But we need to have an outline or a framework of uh the governance of data and just data and then we subtype it into for example single cell sequencing which may expose the patient more readily than bulk sequencing thank you yeah. thank you our next speaker is uh Mohammad Lotfolai he's a, a junior pi at the Sanger Institute uh working uh, on a uh, machine learning uh, approaches for single cell data analysis and um, atlases. Mohammed. nice to see you here. Stay yeah. Here. Hi, Lala. Good to see you again. Yeah. Thanks for having me today. I'm just going to try and see if I can share my screen here. Do you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very excited to be here. I'm also super happy that uh, the, the, the human salat was middle is 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 finally there and it's it's a great way to kind of connect all of us and um so today i'm going to show you one story about one unpublished story which um hopefully be um on biarchive next week about um building and querying spatial single cell atlas using deep generative models so um so my work um has in, during my phd and and now is is about um how we can use machine learning generative modeling to um unboxing and unlocking the potential in human cell atlas um so we can look at human cell atlas and generally single cell atlases as um a very good resource to um or like a search engine we can where we can actually ask um high level queries like which gene programs are change um what is the effect of a certain drug which cells are disrupted and etc so the question is how can we efficiently perform these type of queries and my research has been like throughout the years is is about like um a allowing to query these atlases by mapping a new single cell data set, contextualizing health and disease to see whether you can find difference between health and disease, having a healthy reference as a um, ref, um as a background. Then 
extending that to not just query data set, but also query modalities to see whether we can integrate data set from multiple modalities or which modalities are more important than um, another. The, the other type of queries that we can perform, which is quite important, is like apart from the cell level queries, we would be able to also perform gene level queries or gene program queries. So having a model to query which gene programs are changed between health and disease. So these are like all recent publications that kind of try to address this. And finally, I mean, we're going to um, a, a, a direction that we are now um, using single cell in like um, uh, more cohort level um, atlases to build them. And so the question here is um, not to just compare cell type variation, but rather population level variation. And that was also the, the topic of our recent paper that allows to kind of link both population and cell level variation. But today I'm going to talk about something else going beyond um, um, just seeing all cells, but also capturing um, the, their position in the tissue. So having like a tissue um, level um, perspective of, of what's happening um, in, in health and disease. So the first challenge that we have in this case is it's not quite straightforward, hard to integrate multiple spatial data sets. There are ways to do it. For example, there's like template-based, reference-based approaches where we always need a reference and that could be quite limiting because the reference would not exist for if you go beyond um, certain uh, certain slices or multiple tissues. So that's, 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 that's a very um, restrictive way to do it. The second way is like, as we do clustering on single cell, can we now, assuming that we build a reference for a spatial data, can we go and then find spatial niches? So cells that are communicating with each other as we do for um, single cell um, RNA-seq or single cell ATAC-seq. And finally, once we have these niches, can we now connect these niches with a, with a common language about cell-cell communication, ligand, receptors, their targets, to see whether we can functionally interpret and analyze these um, different niches. So that's basically um, a, sorry, I just have this one thing it has to go here. Um, so that was uh, a, a project led by an amazing PhD student in Helmholtz Munich, Sebastian Burke, working on a method which we call Niche Campus. So Niche Campus is a generative model that kind of addresses all of those problems within one framework, allowing to do interpretable and end-to-end -end analysis of A, building in a spatial atlas without worrying to having a template and mapping to that template. So the model leveraged advances is geometric deep learning. And um, we try to model the spatial data as a graph. And um, the model tries to find um, similar niches across multiple graphs that um, allowed, allow the model to basically um, embed these small neighborhoods aligned on the top of each other. And then the model is also interpretable because we also incorporate domain knowledge using ligand receptor and targets to further annotate these latent spaces of um, deep generative models, which are not commonly interpretable. And so this way you just, uh, you don't just integrate the data, but you rather have an inter interpretable latent space that you can functionally annotate these niches. So I won't go deep into the model, but I'll show you one example in a collaboration with, with Omar Berakar, a, a PI at um, Sanger Institute, where we kind of like have a vignette that we show how we can integrate multiple um, single cell resolution um, spatial data sets. So here you, in, in this example, you have slide seek data set across three different mouse embryos from different slices of tissues. So what you see on the top is basically the histology colored by cell type. And if you give this to niche campus, then you go from this histology and spatial and, and like this um, slices from diff with different coordinates to a common coordinate latent space where you now, as you can do with single cell, cluster this latent space. And in this case, you can find niches that integrate similar regions. So for example, here, I um, highlighted a mouse forebrain across three different embryos. And on the top, uh, in the bottom left, you'll see all of them are integrated into one coherent cluster that is mouse forebrain across three different embryos. So the question is, what are these niches? 
can we interpret what which cell types are communicating in this? And the question is, because we are, yes, an answer is yes, because we are now integrating and really, really learning the activity of single cells and on how they use ligand receptors to communicate with each other, which we call them spatially um, oriented gene programs or general spatial gene programs. And it's quite nice because you can see even using a limited set of gene program, in this case, two gene programs for each niche that we find, you can actually discriminate it from other niches. And if you do a simple um, dendrogram analysis, so hierarchical clustering, what you could see is all of these niches are beautifully linked together to strong to basically build the anatomy in the tissues. You can see like in brain and gut, for example, in brain, you have forebrain, hindbrain, and, and midbrain, they're all, in, in addition to the spinal cord, they're all clustered together building this, um, um, higher um, level of hierarchy in, in, um, in brain. So as one example here is like, okay, we have this beautiful integration, but like, um, can we now use it to further delineate which regions and in, in, in which niches are kind of talking to each other? And the question is using the interpretability of this method is uh, we, we basically saw to differentiate between ventral gut and identify which gene programs, meaning ligand receptor and targets, are driving the difference between ventral god and, and dorsal god. And using this, you can find um, um, ligands and receptors that are known to be um, in, in, um, important for um, regulating integrity of um, intestinal and epithelial barriers, also help to have um, driving um, healthy gut development. But what we also did was we went even, even deeper into this, this kind of brain region to see if we can now subcluster different brain region. And what we found was you could actually find a region called floor plate, which was not initially annotated by original authors. And you can even find the, the gradient of sonic hedgehog, very well known um, regulator and brain development that is kind of diffuse across all the brain region, but is very high in this floor plate region. And we also find a CalCA gene program, another not, uh, not reported and previously reported gene program that can beautifully delineate floor plate, which is really hard to pinpoint using um, gene expression. But now the model kind of like learned to, not to just learn the brain organization, but also find substructures in, in brain. And you can take this model, and look at the tissue and niche communication, not in terms of just ligand receptor, but also a higher entity, in this case, gene programs. So what are the gene programs that are different niches that are using to communicate to each other? So we know floor plate is, is a junction between um, dorsal, uh, sorry, uh, between forebrain and hindbrain, and they're kind of like communicating with 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 this. And you can see it as like as as opposed to like like classical analysis that are based on one or two genes. Here you can see the activity of multiple gene programs, and in this case, Sonic Hedgehog gene program, to see which niches are using this program to talk to each other. And this is all within one model, so you don't need to be worried about batch effect integration and etc. And have all of this interpret interpretability in in, in one region. So uh, yeah, we benchmarked this method. So the methods that are out there for this task just for the integrations are not quite scalable because they're using graphs and it's quite hard to like, engineer these, these large graphs to embed into the memory. And then um, even on the performance here, so we kind of like even come up with the metrics to see how well we can preserve spatial variation and, and, and a tissue level local variation and also identify niches. And the model kind of outperformed existing methods, but beautifully scaled to millions of cells, which is also important to build um, scalable atlases. So just, just one um, um, kind of like um, sketch of like, you can go beyond just gene expression and then apply it on multi-model um, spatial assays where you have chromatin accessibility and gene expression. This is a collaboration with Rong Fang and Castello and, and, and Stockholm where we took um, a, a beautiful data that they generated for um, uh, for mouse brain and post uh, postnatal mouse brain in day 22, where we now actually show you need both of these modalities to further delineate between regions that are not possible to delineate with just one modality. And when we showed it, and um, the, the, the nice part about this is this now opens a door to connect ligand receptors and also transcription factors. 
which would be really beautiful to see. Um, so I won't go deep into the analysis how different transcription factor regulates cell-cell communication. Okay, so with this, I'd like to thank um, a lot of collaborators that, that helped us uh, with this project, but also the, the funders. And um, we have positions available here. And um, yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you, very cool. Okay, let's see if we have uh, any questions. No, I still don't see uh, any questions, but maybe I can start one while I encourage the audience to also participate in the discussion. So- um, It's quite early, Lala, right? I think it's like 8.30, <laughs> people are still- <laughs> Yeah, maybe. So uh, I am wondering about like uh, these unsupervised approaches, right? So there is a lot of biological knowledge there in the community. And then there are there is all these small cell types, rare cell types that uh, are, I mean, people even struggle to capture them in their uh, experiments. So do you see like, the, um, how do you see that? The, like, uh, is there going to be some uh, future directions for involving more supervised uh, learning methods or incorporating the existing knowledge in a, uh, so supervised in terms of like cell type labels in that case, or like supervised with respect to other type of modalities or labels, for example. Kind. So like uh, the work that you presented uh, so today, it so this was more unsupervised. Right? It is more. It's it's more unsupervised. Um, actually, we were struggling quite a bit actually with with how to evaluate this model, right? And even like I mean, for a spatial data analysis, it's not quite straightforward how to define a niche, right? And if you just do a supervised, and you don't have like a priori labels for these niches, right? And you don't know them. And if you use cell type labels, it could be that you're biasing the model to separate across, so basically separating these different cell types in, in the tissue, right? Which might not be always ideal. So you might have a niche which is just, just enriched with one cell type, but ideally you have communication across multiple cell types. So it's 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 not straightforward to how to see we can like we can kind of make this task supervised unless you put a kind of like an induct or like a bias here that say, I know the tissue will divide into five different regions. And then you can use, which is we know for some like for, for specific tissues, they have a very simple anatomy, but for some others we don't have this. So one can use those type of like inductive biases when doing modeling, but incorporating cell type labels and other things could be quite risky because you don't know how the tissue is organized and then how these different niches are kind of like talking to each other. Whereas here we kind of like took in a more like unbiased approaches. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I certainly agree. So thanks a lot, Mohammed. I would uh, love to discuss more. Uh, yeah, definitely happy to.